Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 7th, 2014, and this week's episode is going to be a little different. I have a new book out, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, An Unexpected Guide to Human Nature and Happiness. And the ideas of that book are the subject of this week's conversation. And to do the interviewing, I'm going to allow, and maybe a huge mistake, I'm going to let Mike Munger of Duke University, longtime Econ Talk guest, be the guest host for this episode. And in theory, let me do more of the talking than usual. Mike, uh, how's that? How do you think that's going to work out? Oh, there's a new sheriff in town, baby. <laughs> so, so this week it's it's a mic at the mic, and we're all holding our breath, especially on this end. But uh, seriously, Mike, thanks for uh, doing this, and uh, welcome back to Econ Talk. I'm looking forward to doing it. Uh, okay, your turn. All right. Um, as Russ said, he has a new book that's just coming out. I was lucky enough to get a preprint and. First question that I wanted to ask on seeing it, and I want to inflect this two ways, not inflict, but inflect it two ways. Why did you write this book, Russ? And then why did you write this book? Uh, I don't understand the inflection. Help me out. I, wh- why did I write it and why this yeah, book? So, uh, uh, why does this book need to be written at this point, And why is it that you would write it? Because this is not a book, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, economists don't read this. And so is it, is it going to be a self-help book or is this a book where you hope to get economists to say, you know, I should read that too? Well, I had a couple of goals and, and long-time listeners will remember the six-part series on the theory of moral sentiments uh, that I did with Dan Klein uh, a few years back. And we'll, of course, uh, put up links to that. It's in our archives. But uh, that that set of interviews with Dan got me interested in the book, and I confess I had not read it at that point. I'd read a few famous quotes from it, but nothing more, and I had a few goals in, in writing this book. There, there is a self-help aspect to it. It, it does uh, purport to give you uh, life advice that from Adam Smith based on Smith's ideas and applying them to modern life uh, and how to earn respect of your peers, how to deal with tragedy and triumph uh, and how to interact with the tragedy and triumphs of your friends and your family, uh, how to think about how to act with people close to you versus strangers, uh, what makes us tick, how knowing that helps people interact and be successful in life and uh, really find the good life uh, broadly defined. So on the surface, that doesn't have anything to do with economics, uh, you might argue. I'd argue differently. I would argue that Economics is how to get the most out of life. It's about choices. It's about understanding opportunity cost and using your time wisely. And our time is our scarcest resource. You can't, it's the ultimate non-renewable resource. So for me, the book um, is in that sense in economics. Now there is, of course, actual economics here and there, both in Smith's book and mine, what would we would normally call economics. So that was, one of my goals was to simply take the fascinate what I found fascinating ideas about life and living and work and family and that are in that Smith book and bring them to the present. The second goal I had really was to redeem Mr. Poor Mr. Smith, who for a variety of reasons has a reputation as a, um, as a champion of, of greed. And I think that would have horrified him. He turns in his grave every time someone I think invokes Smith's name in defense of greed. Uh, Smith was very interested in the virtues and the virtues that he emphasizes in this book are prudence beneficence, justice, um, nothing about greed in there. So I, I really love the idea of trying to clear his name in that sense. Finally, I think, uh, as everybody uh, listening to this program knows, I'm not so happy with the mathematicization of economics. And I think Smith's approach to social science generally, whether it's morality or philosophy or what this book is in many ways, a psychology book, uh, inter- intermingled with economics, um, the theory of moral sentiments is, is in many ways a, a mixture of philosophy, psychology, and economics. And I am I like interdisciplinary work. I think that's a lovely thought. But what I care more about is the methodology of 
of narrative and uh, and humility. And I think uh, modern economics has gone a little too far away from those lessons. And I part of me wants to get us back closer to Adam Smith, the social scientist, and what we currently do in social science. It, it is interesting that that theme comes up uh, a fair amount among people that may be seen as heterodox by true, and I'm making air quotes, true economists. So Friedrich Hayek uh, often talks about scientism, pretense of knowledge, the, how in the way that we model things, uh, we're making assumptions about information and structure that we don't have. But Smith's critique and the way that you channel Smith's critique is actually deeper because it has to do with the nature of people and their motivations in choosing. So I think it's hard actually to read even just the wealth of nations and say that Smith thought that people were fundamentally and exclusively greedy. But wealth of nations, as you point out, is more often quoted than read. It may be that theory of moral, moral sentiments is not even usually read anymore, at least not by economists. I was kind of I was wondering about that, so I went and checked the citations in Google Scholar, and. The theory of moral sentiments has the same number of citations since 2000 as the Calculus of Consent. So Calculus of Consent, uh, one of the main books of public choice written by Buchanan and Tulloch, theory of moral sentiments has the same number of citations as that. So it, it's not true that it's not cited, but almost none of those sites are in economics journals. Almost none of those sites are – the citations – are from things where they're addressing what we might think of as being Smith's theory of choice. Um, now that you've read that and you are in a position to offer some critiques of economics, is, is it just the scientism or is it that we're able to – the the selfishness theory is somehow simpler and that in order to understand Smith, you have to – we actually have to work. Yeah, the, one of the things that I thought was charming about your book was you said the first time you took up theory of moral sentiments, you put it down again. He kind of starts in the middle. It's it's hard to read. Yeah, and you were a sympathetic reader. Yeah, I, I had to read it for that interview. And I and as I say at the opening of the book, I had some second thoughts that maybe I shouldn't be uh, doing this. I I think the to get to get at your question, um, I think it's first important to distinguish between selfishness and self-interest. Smith was very, very aware of how self-interested we are, and you might even think of it as self-centered in, in the literal meaning of that word. We are each the center of our own universe. We inevitably think of ourselves uh, most of the time. Uh, we don't think a lot about other people, but we do occasionally, and occasionally we rise to, to greatness and do glorious things for other people without expectation of return. And I think that phenomenon is what motivated Smith to write that book. He, he, he and everyone in his day, and I think any thoughtful person today, admits that self-interest and self-centeredness are, are very relevant. That doesn't get you to greedy, and it doesn't rule out compassionate acts on behalf of other people, even when there's no expectation of return, uh, of a return uh, kindness. So that's what Smith – that's a big part of what motivates Smith in the book. What, what makes us moral? What makes us do things – that we would call, quote, the right thing. So that's one piece that has, you know, economics built into it in, in some sense because it's about behavior. It's about choice. But the other part I think that's that, that we might talk about, and you, you can take it in any direction you want because you're in charge today. But, <laughs> but the other part is that, you know, in economics, our theory of what motivates people is called utility theory. We are agnostic generally about how uh, – what makes people happy. We say it's whatever floats your boat. Uh, we don't say it's uh, sports. We don't say it's music. We don't say it's money. We say it's whatever you choose. And we say that people try to maximize how much satisfaction they get from life given that they have a fixed amount of money and unlimited wants. That's really the essence of uh, homo economicus. That's how people look at – that's how economists are trained to think about human beings. Now, I don't want to debate whether that's realistic or not. I don't. Th I think most economists will, will concede it's not perfectly true. It's not close to perfectly true, but it's a useful framework. I'm not sure it's a useful framework anymore. I've become skeptical of that from teaching microeconomics. Uh, but but the point I want to make is that when Smith, when you ask, if, if you don't ask Smith, but if you read the theory of moral sentiments. Well, you kind of are. You're sort of interrogating. So one of the things I think that's really great about this book is that I sometimes felt I was privy to a conversation between you and Smith. Oh, thank you. Well, that that was part of the goal. Some of that was to try to 
grapple with the ideas in a in a more conversational way because as as everybody knows I'm kind of a conversationalist that's what makes this show but uh the point I was trying to make is that is that Smith's not a maximizer uh Smith's framework of human nature is not easily put into a mathematical framework and what Smith says and I just you know I think about this all the time ever since I read the book uh the theory of moral sentiments and ever since I wrote mine uh, uh man naturally desires not only to be loved but to be lovely and he says i think in three places explicitly that's the road to happiness to be loved and lovely that's the road to serenity tranquility satisfaction whatever you want to call it not not necessarily um partying joy the, the level of exuberant exhilaration we might call happy but what smith meant by it was was satisfaction tranquility and serenity and he says to get there, you don't buy lots of stuff. To, you don't get rich. The way you get there is to be loved and to be lovely. And that's a very different model of human nature uh, than most economists have when they talk about uh, what makes people tick. Well, so it, it, that part reminded me, and you, you start pretty early on, early as uh, page five. You say, Smith helped me understand why Whitney Houston and Marilyn Monroe were so unhappy and then why their deaths made so many people so sad. And then a little further on, he's the father of capitalism. He wrote the most famous examples, maybe the best book ever on why some nations are rich and poor. But he wrote as eloquently in The Theory of Moral Sentiments that about the futility of pursuing money with the hope of finding happiness. One of the things we do as economists is to assume autonomy, that is, people get to make their own choices, and subjectivity, where the definition of happiness is up to the individual. If we were to take this prescription seriously, and I, we, I thought we might take this up again at the end, but to, to foreshadow, what should economists do? What, what, what sort of models or approach to understanding human motivations could we have then other than doing interviews or using surveys? Yeah, that, that's a, obviously a, a tough question. I, I, I'm going to give a two-part answer to that. Um, I think when we're trying to Deal, and this is my advice for teachers. Um, so I'm going to go way out on a on a methodological limb here for people who teach uh, microeconomics or who teach uh, principles of economics. So I did that for about 30 years, and when I first started teaching, I taught the theory of the consumer because that's a bunch of chapters in every textbook, which is utility theory, which is about formalizing the idea that there are trade offs between different goods and and the prices that those goods cost or how I det decide how much to buy of each good. And that's um, – I, I, going back to an interview with Vernon Smith here at EconTalk, uh, when, uh, when I think he asked his professor – I want to say it was um, Leontief at Harvard – what utility theory was good for, uh, Leontief said something like uh, exam questions. And I may be, <laughs> I may be confusing – my version of this of the same joke, which I used to tell, so I'll, we'll go back to the transcript and look it up. But, but the point is that is that I think utility theory is remarkably sterile and not a particularly helpful way to think about consumer choice. And what it mainly leads to in an intermediate micro class or even a principles class is the demand curve. And somewhere along the way, uh, I realized that the enormously complex apparatus of indifference curves and budget lines, there are a few lessons. I don't want to say there's zero, but overwhelmingly what you get out of that is you generate a demand curve. And I don't know why we wouldn't just say, let's assume that people buy less when the price gets higher, uh, holding everything else constant, which is what a demand curve is. Uh, you know, I don't know why we spend all that class time generating that curve when it's just okay to start with that as a working assumption. So that's the first point. That's a methodological point. The deeper point, when you say, what should economists do? I, you know, the, the, the challenge here is that, you know, I push the idea that economics is an art and a craft rather than a science. And it's easy to criticize economics the way I do and say, oh, it's not scientific. People don't really maximize utility. The predictions are too strong. They don't, they're not borne out by the data. When we try to use the data in ways that are consistent with the theory, we put uh, too much pressure on the data that you can't withstand, and it's the conclusions are not reliable, they're not precise. We can't estimate the elasticity of demand, for example. We can't 
assume a particular mathematical form of the utility function. I mean, that's just bizarrely, to my mind, it's just strange. But we people do that. I don't think that's very fruitful. So then the question is, so, okay, so let's be more realistic. Let, let's, you could say, let's give economics a richer palette. Let's talk about the fact that people care about their reputation. They don't just care about how much stuff they have. Let's talk about the fact that they care about love. Let's talk about the fact that their family is often the, the unit at which they make decisions and not just uh, themselves, not purely individualistic. And of course, Gary Becker, more than anyone, took the formal apparatus of economics and applied it, tried to apply it to these types of non-financial demand curve purchases of goods decisions. And obviously, he made a tremendous contribution to that. So there is some value to that formalization. But I would argue most of the time the value is is coming from our intuition and our common sense and Smithian type uh, ideas about how people behave and what makes them tick. If you go too far in that direction, you're left with psychology. You don't have a theory. You just have every case is unique. And I think what makes the approach I'm advocating for tenable as a as some sort of discipline rather than just a thoughtful person opining about human behavior is is markets. So when you embed the choices that people make into market decisions, you get a very different uh, set of of insights that you wouldn't get if you just treat everybody individually as a mix of rational, irrational, altruistic, self-centered, et cetera. And again, Vernon Smith said this says this very well. I don't know. I think he said it when I interviewed him and he says it lots of other places. Sure, people make mistakes all the time. Sure, people aren't perfectly rational. So the quote economic model is silly and wrong. But in markets, markets discipline those decisions. They teach people what works and doesn't work. Don't and doesn't work. They also uh, punish bad decisions. They take away your money if you consistently make bad decisions. Markets provide you information to help you be wiser than you are on your own. So I think that's where I'd try to that that's the synthesis I'd I'd like to think about. May, may I ask you how far on that you're willing to go? I think you were in an economics department in business school. You won a number of teaching awards as an economist. I basically never got a job as an economist. I'm, I've been a political scientist for a long time. So often early in class, so you I have a PhD say, in economics. Um, I do, and yeah, I just- I. My all my original training and a lot, I think, of the way that I think is the way that economists should think. But of course, that's self-serving. So I, I want to see, I want to see your skepticism and raise you a little bit and see how far you'll go with this. I in, when I teach class, I say Homo economicus is a sociopath. No society <laughs> composed of Homo economicus could yeah. possibly survive. Yeah, and the reason is. We would cheat on deals if we thought we could get away with them. So what I, what I want to advocate is actually, and this is, this is a terrible thing to admit, that Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was actually right about something, that the real way to understand a successful society is not to treat morals and the constraints that society puts on us as constraints, but as part of the objective function. And so what that means in more English is it's something that we want to accomplish, not something that constrains what we want to accomplish. We actually care about what other people think about us. And so on page 186, you have a great paragraph. We never stop to think about how it came to pass that we live in a world that's fairly decent, a civilized world. Yes, we have a legal system that legislates against the worst crimes, such as theft and murder, but our conscience keeps us on the straight and narrow. And the conscience then, so end quote, the conscience, the way I see that is it's not a constraint. I really want to do all these bad things, but I'm prevented because I would feel guilty. It actually matters that I want to be perceived and to be lovely in your terms. So it is is that going too far or should we put moral convictions and our sense of desire to be admired by others and to be admirable into the set of objectives that people try to achieve? Well, certainly, um, by the way, of course, that phrase lovely is – and use that word is not mine. It's Smith's. But um, thanks for the implicit compliment. Um, 
when you say something and Russ, like, I think you're lovely. <laughs> uh, it's a lifetime struggle to be lovely. <laughs> it's seriously, it's a fascinating thing to think about. Um, uh, one of the themes of, of the book is is mindfulness and the idea that you should be aware of how you are perceived by others. And um, Smith's very honest about the fact that we don't really want to do that. Uh, but when you force yourself to do that, um, it's a very powerful experience for thinking about how to be a better person, how to be more successful, et cetera. Yeah, that's the, that's the self-help part yeah. is that if you can get through the, your, the barriers that you've constructed to thinking about that, not only will you understand more, but you'll be happier. Right, which is – but it's challenging. So you know, to, I, I can't get the quote exactly right, but he says something like, bold is the surgeon whose hand does not tremble when he operates upon himself – and uh, we don't like to operate upon ourselves. We don't like – we like to criticize others. We know, ourselves, not quite as much. Um, and especially in today's world where self-esteem and, and is so venerated and, and praised, uh, the whole idea of being critical of one's own conduct, of being aware of one's, own, of one's flaws is not easily um, accessed in today's culture. But to go back to your Rousseau question, I'm not sure I understand it. So let me, let me see if I can see if well, I Well, so can. What, what Rousseau said was that – in order to understand people, in order to, for society to work, we must inscribe the law on their hearts. So the law is not something external. We inscribe it on their hearts, and then they'll follow it without any police because it, a, it's written on their heart. That's exactly what Smith's talking about, and I, and I, I just want to add that, that uh, you know, what makes Smith's contribution about the power of conscience so, so novel – is not just the point that conscience restrains bad conduct. I think that's that's well understood since at least Rousseau um, and probably before. But I think what Smith's contribution is is thinking about where our conscience comes from. And in Smith's uh, conception, it doesn't come from our religious upbringing. It doesn't come from our parents, you know, teaching us and modeling for us. It comes from our fears and hopes for what other people think of us. And that's his whole concept of the impartial spectator, the idea that when we choose an action, we're confronting a dilemma, when we're deciding when how to act, we are imagining someone who is disinterested, meaning not self-interested, someone who does not have um, a stake in the outcome, observing us and judging us accordingly. And that's a really powerful metaphor, which, um, which is Smith's real contribution to this whole idea of conscience. But to come back to the more general point about society, um, I think S Smith's great point, which uh, I doubt Rousseau shared, is that the inscription of virtue on our hearts comes not from the top down but from the bottom up. And Smith uh, writes incredibly eloquently about how norms of civility and behavior and trust emerge from our interactions with each other because he argues that ultimate it's deep down that we have a fundamental and this is the this is the uh the only really uh, optim I don't know what the right way to phrase this is uh, idealistic side of Smith he he argues that deep down because we he says we naturally desire not only to be loved but to be lovely naturally desire meaning it's it's hardwired into us that we care about what other people think of us and we want to earn their respect and so as a result, knowing that and even not knowing it, un subconsciously, I'm going to let other people influence me and I will in turn influence other people with my judgments about their behavior and their judgments about my behavior. I'll, I will praise them when they do good deeds and I will be look askance when they do things that are less moral. And what Smith argues is that that's what produces civilization. That's what produces a world where trust can be imaginable forget the fact that it's that it's not perfect it's not perfect but the fact that it works at all is shocking when you think step back and think about uh, how self-interested we actually are and smith says the inevitable interactions we have with the people around us are, are going to constrain us because we care about what they think of us this is what i think is so great about that insight is not just that it works as well as it does but i don't think you could have a society unless people thought of themselves and each other that way. So what's interesting about Smith's insight was that he actually foresaw something that later um, biologists have made an argument for as part of 
something that's a, that w- humans are adapted for in evolutionary terms for a kind of cooperation that's considerably more than you would get from modeling people as homo economicus. And so Vernon Smith and others over and over again have found that we're kind of natural cooperators. There's plenty of situations where you can get us to not to, get us not to cooperate. But what's interesting is that we often will, and we can make up stories about that, but Smith actually has a really great story about it. And it's a metaphor, it's the impartial spectator but it actually gets you a lot of the results that we've, we've since come to by completely different means. And so when you talk about the stories that people tell on your page uh, 64 and 65, you have uh, the football coach who quits because he wants to spend more time with his family. Politicians always do that. There's a, a sort of uns, unspoken deal where if I want to fire you, but you agree to announce you want to spend more time with yeah. your family – I'll say that oh you and, and he's a good family man he he he, yeah. he quit. Yeah, and, and my and my so, claim my claim in the book of course is that is that somebody who works uh oh I don't know let's say um uh over 100 hours a week 110 hours a week uh watching football film kind of hard to argue they're they're family oriented but cuz that's what it takes to be a successful football coach. And they it, take a new job as level. soon as they can. Yes, they can. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, but but you also say, I go to, I have a problem with my plumbing and it depends who I ask what the solution is going to be. So one guy wants to put in new pipes. One guy wants to use the snake. And in each case, it's the stuff that they actually sell. But it doesn't mean that they're bad or malicious. They actually think that those things work. And if nothing else, they've persuaded themselves that that's the right thing for you to do. So human beings are pretty good at detecting dissembling, at fibbing. And so the best salesman is going to be someone who actually believes. Yeah. So you can explain at the same time these two things. People are making an argument that appears to be self-interested, but actually believe, have persuaded themselves and are trying to persuade you that it's the right thing for you to do. And so... The, the 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 problem that, that we may have is recognizing that and most importantly, recognizing it in ourselves, that these things that we know to be true. So your description of your reading of uh, econometric essays, you know which ones are correct and well <laughs> conducted by the fact by, by the conclusions. So yeah, it's just confirmation by it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now that's a um, Smith makes you think about that, and of course, that's an issue I've just been thinking about for a long time now, from the work of Taleb and uh, Jonathan Haidt and um, and others. It's um, very hard not to fool oneself. And what I find fascinating, a- absolutely fascinating, is that given how much time I think about self deception, I still fool myself all the time. Well, not all the time, but but uh, uh, it's not zero. And you'd think I'm pretty sensitive to it, and yet uh, I can I can find myself um, loving a study still that I know is flawed when I step back and think about it, just because it comes to conclusions I like. I wonder if we could talk for a second about evolution. Then there's a in there's as you may know there's a field now called. Um, experimental philosophy, which I just think is a wonderful <laughs> phrase, because uh, if there's anything that's not experimental, yeah. it should be philosophy. <laughs> well, but what people are interested in is a kind of philosophy of mind, why it is that people think the way that they do. So there's an interesting question. Why do we have emotions? For in, in biological terms, what is adaptive about having emotions? Human beings are more emotional than most animals. and A lot more. Well, and so the uh, now we, we, we laugh, we hard. feel guilt. Yeah. And so Mark Mark Twain said that human beings are the only ones who laugh or or should, <laughs> because <laughs> if you're watching each other, the foibles of each other. Maybe laughing helps us deal with that, rather than think of it as being hypocrisy. But one of the things that emotions do is provide the public good of norm enforcement. And if I see you behaving badly, I should just think, ah, he's behaving badly. But if I try to correct him. Uh, he'll yell at me, I'll get hurt. He probably has some reason where he can explain it in his own mind. And yet more often than you might expect, we'll confront even strangers who we think are behaving badly. So is that is there something that the, it, 
might it be that I perceive you acting badly and I think that your impartial spectator is defective? And so I try to stand in for it. Yeah, yeah. So a uh, couple things. First of all, you know, Smith, uh, writing before Darwin, although he influenced Darwin greatly uh, because of his understandings of competition, uh, but Smith, writing before Darwin, didn't think about evolution. He, he talked about the author of nature. Uh, mm -hmm. which was God. And you know, I had an interesting discussion with, with Dan Klein with how much of a religious person Adam Smith is. But, um, you know, certainly the emotions you're talking about are hardwired. They're, they're not I th mostly. They're, they're obviously things we learn culturally about how to respond to all kinds of things, but the underlying emotions are, are hardwired into us. And, um, and now I'm the guest and I've lost my train of thought. So what was your – when I see, when I'm the host and I lose my train of thought, I edit it out. It's fabulous. <laughs> and I could still edit this out, but I won't. I'm going to let you rephrase the last part of that question. Remind me again what you were asking. Well, the, the I go up to someone and when I yell at them, in oh, effect, what yeah, I'm yeah. saying is their impartial spectator yeah, is yeah. defective. Yeah, so you know, one time um, – well, more than once actually uh, – and you may can, maybe you can relate to this and other listeners. I've been in a public place with my children and I've been reprimanded by a stranger for their behavior. Uh, I will say this happened uh, the two times that are most vivid to me. They both happened on the coasts and maybe this is a coastal phenomenon. So uh, I was in Cape Cod when my kids were little on a summer vacation and my kids were we're running up and down the, sound, the sand dunes, which, of course, every child and many adults want to do. And uh, somebody stood up and said and screamed, yelled at the, on the beach, whose children are these? I looked up for my book and I thought, well, I guess they're mine. How <laughs> dare you allow these children to desecrate this natural environment? So I apologized and I mentioned the kids, you know, the dunes are somewhat fragile. It's probably best not to run on them. And I got them off. Uh, another time we were in uh, at Big Sur at uh, Julia Pfeiffer State Park, which is one of the most beautiful spots on the face of the earth. And uh, there's a look, out, a look over where you can see an overlook. I guess they both work where you can see this gorgeous waterfall falling onto a beach and look in the other direction. There's great stuff to see. It's a very famous spot. Uh, you can find images of it on the web. I think I've got the name of the state park right. So um, my kids, one of my, one of my kids is carving uh, some word, not a bad word, just some word, maybe just a shape into the bark of a tree. Um, With a knife. Uh, he, well, he didn't have a knife, but I don't know what he, I think he's using a stick maybe. I don't know what he was maybe doing. A stick or a stone, but, but, but something was, that effectively did tear was, up the bark. He was defacing the tree and um, a, a person came up to me and, when I went over to talk to my kids and said, I think the word that she said was horrific. I think she said, this is <laughs> horrific or horrifying. And I wanted to say two things. I just apologized and said to my child, stop, but uh, my son, but, but I wanted to say, no, um, genocide is horrific. Yeah. Uh, bark on a tree, not horrific. And the second thing I wanted to say is there are about 80 or a thousand, I don't know, a big number of people who've already mark the bark of the tree. I don't argue that that makes it okay to then add to it, but it's possible that the tree is sustainable in its, in its life without this little extra piece of bark still because I'm not sure it's decisive and maybe a different tone would be appropriate, et cetera. So um, having said that, uh, most of the time in my life, or not most of the time, but many times in life, uh, it's very hard to judge other people publicly or even sometimes privately. So one of the things I, I concede in the book is that, you know, I think in Smith's day, which is the mid-18th century, in Smith's day, being judgmental of others was easier, uh, for better or for worse. We live in a much more tolerant age. And when people do things that are immoral in our day, most of the time, a lot of the time, people just shrug. And they say, uh, that's not my business. And I shouldn't judge another person. And I think people are very uncomfortable playing the role of the partial spectator, the actual spectator uh, with their friends and, and colleagues at work, et cetera. So I, you know, Smith's mechanism for culture and civilization, which is the, the critical remark, the raised eyebrow, the I'm not going to go to his parties anymore because he's not a nice person, 
Uh, I think that's less common today, or at least I feel that it is. I feel it's much harder for us. You know, somebody will brag to me about something they did to get a, a good deal, say, at the grocery or in a, on the web. And I look at that behavior sometimes and I think, gee, I think that's immoral. I understand it's legal, but I think it's immoral. I find it difficult. Sometimes I say it, but oftentimes I say, well, I'm just going to ignore that. I'm not going to clamor. I'm not going to jump in with praise for it like the person's asking me to. Wow, that was clever. But I just, you know, and the other example I think is, you know, is a joke that's in bad taste. It's very hard to say. That doesn't funny to me. I said it uh, when people tell jokes that I think are, you know, cruel cruel or inappropriate or or, or cruel mainly. And um, But it's hard. And our culture doesn't encourage it in the way I think it did in Smith's time. Nonetheless, we're more likely to do it than we would if we were just purely reason motivated, because if you confront someone, they're going to think less of you. They're probably not going to uh, be persuaded. Now, in your case, you you did defer in the two cases about the children, but you were thinking, oh, please, come on. So what I think is interesting is that there's kind of a black box and the contents of it are socially constructed. So it's different in different societies, but all human beings... All human beings have an emotional reaction if whatever the contents of their black box are are violated by someone else. It's less likely we can make excuses for ourselves. So in some societies, if people cut in line, the norm of the line is not very strong. But I I had a time, and I think we've talked about this before on uh, Econ Talk. I was standing in line. A young woman cut in front of me when I tried to confront her. She said, if you say one more word, I'm going to call the police. (laughs) I was so yeah. <laughs> well, but but I was so upset. The point is, she was costing me twenty seconds. Right. All I had to do was say nothing. I was so upset, I almost couldn't sleep that night. It took me hours to fall asleep. When I, I was thinking of, you know, I should have said this. I should have said this. Why? That's crazy. Just let it go. But I couldn't. I was unable to. So we have an emotional response. We are suffused with a cocktail of chemicals that actually put a sort of bright mark in our brains on that memory and it's it's much stronger than it should be if we were just reasoning creatures and so the the power of that emotional it's kind of a subsidy or an an inducement to provide the uh public good of norm enforcement means that people are more likely to try to take into account other people's reactions because they're more likely to react than they would be if they were just homo economicus yeah. So if if I may, one more example, when yeah. I was in Germany, I'm crossing a street against the light and this little tiny grandmother tries to beat me with an umbrella. So I mean, she wasn't hitting me hard, but she was beating me and saying, kinder murder, kinder murder. And I, so she meant I was, I was a murderer of children because children might see this and then they would cross and they might cross when there was a car. And so you must not disobey the rules. These rules must be obeyed. And if not, little grandmothers will come out of the woodwork to try to beat you with umbrellas. Yeah. So that emotional response is, is I think, some of what Smith intuited without any of the evolutionary apparatus that we now look back with. Yeah, or the neuroscience and, and yeah. brain research that we're doing. I, I just want to, I want to footnote what I said earlier because I think you made me realize I'd overstated. Um, when I said it's hard to be critical, you make the correct point. It's a black box, that, and what's in the box varies by society and by time. And the more I think about it, you know, the environmental issues are clearly examples where people are very comfortable criticizing other people. Yeah. And, and let's forget the sand dunes and the redwoods, which um, I don't think they were redwoods, but they might have been in Big Sur, which I'd love redwoods too. But 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 the point I want but the point I want to make That's is horrific. That, yeah, it is horrific. But I want to, it was it was so <laughs> horrific. You you can't believe it. Uh, but the point I want to make, uh, take, away, take away a little bit of the emotion, I want to look at littering. Uh, you know, littering is something that – a perfect example. Right? Littering is something that when I was a little boy in, in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s, everybody littered. That's what you did. You know, you were driving down the road, and we probably talked about this, but it, it bears repeating. You, you tossed your popsicle wrapper out the window when you're driving down the, 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 the street. Uh, yeah, it was sticky. You're not going to keep yeah, it in the car. And you threw stuff down on the road, on the street all the time. And that ended through peer pressure. That end, yes, there were some public campaigns. There were ads. There were billboards. There were fines. But those are really, uh, the. of course, the, the real test is that 
I would never litter on a deserted highway driving by myself. You know, yeah. it's not just that my wife's going to frown at me. It's not my kids are going to tease me. Though those things are true. They but are. Still, but, but even, even by myself, weren't. I'm not going to do it. And I've I've absorbed that norm through the impartial, through some actual spectators and then through the norm of the impartial imaginary spectator. I basically say, I don't want to do this. This is not who I am. I'm not a litterer. And uh, even though it does, of course, create jobs for people um, in a very uh, – Keynesian way of, of picking up the litter. But um, I'm um, that's that's an example where people are incredibly judgmental. Another example would be smoking. Uh, it's not okay to smoke in most of the, the circles that I'm in. And anybody, this is just fascinating. When I was, you know, when I was a little boy, when I was, in my, again, we're in the 1960s now, my father smoked. You'd go over to somebody's house, there are ashtrays around. You'd lit up a cigarette when you wanted to. Just like you'd open a soda when you want to or, or, you know, take money out of your wallet. It was just a normal human thing people did all the time. Now, the idea that – can you imagine being at a dinner party at someone's house and just taking out a cigarette and lighting it? it it's a faux pas of enormous proportions. We, we would be horrified. In fact, Everybody else, would, you would be horrified. You can't even ask. It, it went from light up whenever you want to, do you mind if I smoke? Is that okay? Uh, oh, sure. Go ahead. To – Excuse me, I have to go outside. Where are you going? Well, I yeah. have to smoke, and of course, I can't do it in here. Uh, yeah. That that evolution, again, there was some top down pressure on it, but most of it, a lot of the enforcement and evolution of that norm about smoking came from uh, actual spectators, and then on top of that, afterwards, an imaginary spectator. The example I give in the book of a similar phenomenon is, is corporal punishment, striking your children when uh, when they misbehave. My my parents cuffed me from – I never got a, a, a whipping, but I was cuffed from time to time. I was – I was <laughs> right? Not often. Oh, yeah. But, but I was. And I always assumed being a good parent because my, I liked my parents. I respected them. I, of course, I would strike my own children to keep them disciplined. I've never hit my children. Um, I've wanted to. I confess that in the book. Um, my editor said, don't put that in. That sound, doesn't sound good. But it's true, and I don't mind it. Well, but it's an it. illustration. I mean you wanted to and didn't. Yeah, and I wanted to. It, but probably he, wouldn't. Even if you'd been by yourself with just the kids and they might not have really blamed you, you didn't do it because ah, that's just, not right. I just decided it was wrong. And that, again, mo there are plenty of people who still strike their kids. Uh, but in, in many of my circles, that just isn't done. And uh, that's interesting that that evolved without any top down. It just emerged. And I think – Obviously, I think Smith helps us understand that. I think markets help us understand it. But what's interesting for Smith's insi insight is that it doesn't take place through the normal prices that we think of in markets. It takes place through emotional prices. It takes place through people glaring at you in, in the supermarket when you if you smoked or littered or be hit your kid. Right? So you can hit your kid still in America, not too much, but you can still give your kid a, a little bit of a whack. And if you do that in public – uh, in certain supermarkets, you're going to get glared at. In others, I think you'd be – people go, would applaud. So it, it, it yeah. is, it's dependent on geography, time, place, et cetera. But those norms are, uh, as you say, they're, they're emotionally driven and what gets put in the black box of what I emotionally, viscerally, quote, irrationally or irrationally react to comes from the people around me. Yeah. So experience and my own thoughts about what's right and wrong, but there's, it's a recursive process and it can change. It changes slowly, but it can change. So what I wanted to ask about is altruism. I want to make sure that the listeners understand that Smith's not talking about what we might call altruism where – I mean you have sympathy. You do have sympathy for others and so I feel bad when the people in China die in the earthquake, but it's – much less than me worrying about my own little finger in, in the wealth of nations. Um, no, it's in the theory it, of moral sentiments, actually. No, that's, in the, that's in TMS. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about the prospect of losing my little finger tomorrow morning, which would be pretty bad. I, you know, I, I know I have to go and they're going to chop off my little finger. That would be pretty awful. And I, I can't do anything about the, the millions of uh, people. It doesn't have to be Chinese. People somewhere far away. I... One difference is now I can see it on television, so maybe it is more real. I do feel a little bit, it's not quite so abstract. I can see pictures of children. I wanted to ask about altruism and 
what you would think is the the kind of level of importance that Smith would have, because this story about the impartial spectator could be self-interest properly understood. I live in a group. The esteem of that group is important for my flourishing, for my children to have a, a family name uh, where you know other people trust us, and so it's a it's a, a broader kind of conception of self-interest. Is there any actual room for altruism in Smith? Yeah, there is. It's just it's not very big. He says, um, here's the quote. He says, uh, he's talking about, I'm glad you brought up the earthquake because uh, it's so important. And people quote that passage and they say, Smith's hard hearted. He thinks we're awful people because we care more about our little finger than earth than we do about millions of people dying in an earthquake. And of course, he's correct that I would sleep much less well the night before a minor surgery than I would after a earthquake that killed thousands or millions of people very far away. Uh, and maybe even somewhat close, but his example was to, you know, it's a little bit of a reductio ad absurdum. So millions of people dying far away. I might express some sadness. I might make, give some charity to the Red Cross to help the people, but I can sleep like a baby that night. Uh, but knowing I have surgery tomorrow, I can't sleep even though it's to my little finger. The, the punchline of the story is, 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 is coming up. The punchline is, even though you feel that way, if you had a chance to save your little finger by killing millions of people, you wouldn't think about it for a second because it's yeah. too horrific uh, yeah. to, to use the correct word there. Um, and that's – the question is why. And S Smith's point is that it's not because you're a wonderful person, the altruism you're talking about. It's because – well, it's, and it's not because people would think less of you. He's really saying that you've internalized the lessons of people thinking less of you. You, you realize – through living, through going through life, through dealing with other people, that you are small and, and and relative to the rest of the world, and that your life is not as important, is no more important than the million, even though it feels like it is, it's no more important than than someone's life in China. And in this sense, Smith's very much a universalist, and 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 it's a wonderful, I think, correct way to think about the world. And for you to take the lives of strangers to save a piece of your life is just, it's just wrong. And 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 you wouldn't countenance you countenance it. You wouldn't think about it. You wouldn't imagine actually executing that plan because you would think so little of yourself afterward. Yep. And you wouldn't even imagine yourself as being able to imagine. Yeah, it. So to, even to at one remove, I, I wouldn't consider that. So he says, "This is a great quote." I love when he says this. Um, he says, "It is not the soft power of humanity. It is not that feeble spark of benevolence which nature has lighted up in the human heart." that is thus capable of counteracting the strongest impulses of self-love, close quotes. So what he's saying there is we have some altruism, but it's a feeble spark. It isn't the main driving force of why we do the right thing. What makes us do the right thing is we want to think well of ourselves. We want to be loved. We want people to respect, by loved he meant respect, admired, honored, uh, thought well of. And we want to be lovely. And by that he meant decent, respectable, honorable, uh, good. And he's saying deep down, that's what we want. Now, we have to fight against the fact that we mainly like ourselves because we don't have much of a – it's a feeble spark that works in the other direction. And so what makes that feeble spark active, the reason that we do generous things and the reason we don't do horrific things is because we imagine thinking about what other people think of us. And, of course, then, in fact, we get the result of what other people think of us when we actually choose to do bad things or, or virtuous things. Uh, so that's – now, I just want to make one side note. We talked earlier about, about Gary Becker and the utility function. You know, my first, uh, uh, I think it was first, yeah, my first published paper in economics was putting altruism in the utility function. Uh, you know, I, I built a model which was based on Gary Becker's work of saying we don't just care about our own happiness. We care about the, what other people consume. So poor people make me sad. And so that motivates me to give to charity. And that's the way an economist looks at charity. An economist looks at charity and says, uh, there's a price of charity, which is I have to give up my own consumption. And in return, I get the satisfaction from helping other people. And I'll just presume that that's there. Smith had a richer conception of what motivates charity and our behavior. And it's not just the form of self-interest once removed that you're talking about, oh, if I give to charity, people think highly of me and then I'll be happy. Uh, it's also just, it's the right thing to do. And I am motivated at times 
not to do a lot, but to do some things to help others simply because I want to see myself as someone who does the right thing. And what's so great about this explanation is that it recognizes the, I think, perfectly correct observation that, yes, we actually have a spark of beneficence and we would do it to, to help people, but it's it's not very big. What makes things work is having this additional impulse. And it's not just to have others think well of us, but to be able to think well of ourselves. Yeah. And that's a whole extra thing. There's a famous story, Richard Alexander, the University of Michigan um, evolutionary biologist who was just a fierce opponent of any kind of group selection or altruism had this ongoing argument with uh, one of his colleagues. There's no altruism anywhere in the animal kingdom. It can't exist. The gene is selfish, just like Richard Dawkins says. So one of the, one day, it was a, a spring day, the colleague is walking along the sidewalk and he sees an earthworm. So he says, aha, he picks up the earthworm and he puts it over in the grass because it would have died. It would have gotten mashed on the sidewalk. And he runs to Richard Alexander's office and mm-hmm. tells Alexander about this and says, ah, it was a, I got my fingers all sticky. This, you have to admit, was an altruistic act. And Alexander says, yes, it was until you told me. <laughs> <laughs> if you had just done it and not told me, I might concede that, but you didn't. So the, it, we really do care that, that other people see us as, as being good absolutely, people. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a, that's a beautiful story, except, of course, what it misses is that if he had knocked on his door and he hadn't been in, he still would have been happy to have not stepped on the earthworm. Yes, right. yes. And, and I so think, I, think, I think Alexander is wrong, but he's right about he's the essential something. point. Yeah, he's on to something. It, it's not pure <laughs> altruism. It's that it might be enough that the colleague would be able to think of himself, aha, I'm an altruist. I see myself as an altruist. Not so much that he is, but the, that what he bought for himself by getting his hand sticky was the, the, the right, the licensing to see himself as being yep. a good person. And it's, it's, you know, Maimonides, uh, the great uh, medieval Jewish philosopher and thinker, talks about the different levels of charity of helping other people. And the highest level is uh, helping someone get off of charity by teaching them a trade or a craft or finding a way for them to work. The lowest level is for me to give you money and I know who you are and you know who I am. The highest level below finding a person a job is anonymity. I give you money. I don't know who, I think it's, I don't know who you are, but certainly you don't know who I am. I don't get to bask in your uh, gratitude or unease that I'm helping you. You maintain, I think, a different level of dignity. So people do give anonymously, not just that the donor recipient doesn't know, but no one knows or almost no one knows, uh, sometimes literally no one. And of course, I think that is that a higher level? I don't know, but there is something somehow more admirable about not taking some of the glory and letting it uh, that not be part of the equation. It's interesting because I'm not I've never thought about that before. It's is actually uh, it reminds me a little bit of the conversations you and I have had. I think about profit seeking. Somebody who does a good deed and makes money at it. Certainly, the making money doesn't seem to reduce the value of the deed. It's still a good deed. Uh, I think I think what's so important about what you just said is Richard Alexander or a, a biologist would say, but you put it in the black box by writing it down and saying it's the highest principle. You still know. So it wouldn't if, if you had donated, but it was truly anonymous and you didn't know you had donated. <laughs> why would you do it? it? It actually matters that, you know. Yeah, that's true. So Maimonides wrote it down, put it in the black box. This is the set of things that you get to feel really good about yourself if you do. And in fact, it's one of the highest. And so you think, you know, I'm a good person because I did this. But of course, Maimonides, and I want to, this is a, going off track a little bit, but I think it's, it's a, such an, a, an important point. Maimonides wasn't just interested in the alleviation of poverty. He was, he thought that was a great thing. But he's also interested in character refinement. Yeah. And I think one of the flaws of policy in the modern world, it, ironically, is that we look at material outcomes as the only thing that counts. That's certainly an economist's scorecard. So it doesn't matter how the poor get their money, whether they earn it, I give it to them, the government gives it to them. And I think in reality, those three are very different. Uh, and similarly, if, if I help my parents – and I overcome the free riding problem with my siblings, and I overcome the issues of, of 
parent-child relationships and I help sustain them in their old age, that's somehow the same as you helping my parents through Social Security. And I don't think those are the same. I think yeah. that part of being a human being is is over, being a good human being is overcoming your self-interest at times and and doing it through private voluntary action is very different than course of taxation. And I just think we've lost that totally. And that's, I think, is sad. Part of the reason we've lost it, I think, is the economic methodology that we we're talking about earlier. Sure. Yes. Because once you start thinking in terms of utility, so the in the Christian tradition, particularly in the Protestant Christian tradition, the important thing about faith to be salvatory is that it be authentic. And that means it has to be voluntary. So it can't be coerced. And so Roger Williams, when he founded... By definition, um, I can't force well, you to believe something. You have to... Belief can't so be I coerced. Can't, I can't force you to act as if you believe it. And so, you know, having rules about attending church on Sunday, not drinking, those rules actually protect you from having to think this through and do it voluntarily. And so you're actually condemning people to hell because they're not able to develop their character and do it voluntarily on their own. And so one of the, the establishment of Rhode Island, uh, the, the reason that they argued for toleration, um, you have to allow people to sin for them to have any hope of being saved because it has to be, the, their faith has to be authentic. Yeah. which means that there has to be the possibility that they that they do something else. Well, that raises the possibility of evil. We don't have much time left, but I did want to ask what Smith's view of evil is. And the reason I wanted to ask was that I'm a big fan of movies. And one of the things that I think makes for a good movie villain is there's two basins of attractions. There's two sweet spots. One is a movie villain who is incomprehensibly evil and where there's no sympathy, but does it in a way where they otherwise feel fairly human or someone that you're actually pretty sympathetic to and you understand their motives and then you're horrified at the fact that you're sympathizing with this villain. So if, if Adam Smith were a consultant, if you could bring him now and Quentin Tarantino is going to have a movie where he has a truly horrifying villain, uh, what, how might we think about this absence of sympathy as something that when we confront it, this is someone who's not governed by uh, an impartial spectator, this villain, but they have to be aware of the fact they can't just be autistic or mentally incapable of understanding. They fully understand the social norms the, the, that they're transgressing by killing or torturing and yet do it anyway. Is that why? I mean, my real question is, is that why we find movie villains so horrifying is that they're violating what Smith tells us is actually the nature of people. So when I look at Javier Bardem's character in um, No Country for Old Men, so the, the guy um, who was the, the Russian killer, he was just chaos. He was able to kill completely without compunction, and yet he had certain rules that he followed. I don't know if you've seen the movie. Some of the listeners have probably seen the movie. He used dice or random chance to decide who would live or die, which is completely different. So is the, this was a long intro for what's really a pretty short question. Is can we use what you've discovered about Smith to help us understand why it is that we find effective movie villains so horrible? And that's that it's that absence of an effective impartial spectator. Well, it's fascinating. I, I, there's a third type of, of uh, villain you didn't mention, which is uh, the redemption villain, right? The, the movie where the, the, the movie open is a very common theme when the, when the villain starts out uh, as, as a villain and then, through some set of lessons, trans, is transformed into a, into a good person. Yeah, those uh -huh. movies sell like hotcakes when yeah. they're done well because there is something deep inside us that wants to see that transformation, which is fascinating. Yeah. Actually, when you think about it, it's um, yeah, it's, a, it's an affirmation of these Smithian yes. values. And on the pure evil thing, it's I, I think you're right. I I don't have much to add to your in, to your analysis, which is why that long intro was was totally worth it. I'm not going to cut a second of it, Mike. Um, <laughs> But the uh, – and I, I should just mention, by the way, I, it, you know, people have asked me uh, – guests always ask me, you know, is, are these edited? There's basically no edits to Econ Talk. It's just our conversation. 
The only things I edit out are um, obscenities, which occasionally get muttered by a guest. Uh, if I can, <laughs> if I can find a way to save the the train of thought, um, a sneeze or a cough or losing the train of thought, which I do ha- happens to me about once every two episodes, um, and and so these are not edited, and I'm not. I didn't edit out any part of that of that intro, and it's it was utterly fascinating. What I want to add to it is that Smith. Actually, a number of places in the book, and I don't write much about this. I didn't find a, a good place to, to write about it. But he writes a lot about what grabs our uh, our attention as viewers of drama. And I think he says uh, a, move, a, a drama about a man who loses his leg is a lot less interesting than a movie about – than a drama about a man who loses his mistress. Um, and, and, and that's interesting by, by in and of itself. But that's not your question. Uh, but I think you're right. I think that uh, someone who, who does not respond to the normal norms, and my my version of this would be the Joker in the Batman movies. Yeah, and I actually absolutely. actually did can enjoy those movies. Um, you know, friends of mine who love them, um, I just um, after the first one, Batman Begins, which I thought was marvelous. Uh, the second one, uh, which is I think the Dark Knight, right? Uh, the yeah. second one, I just I found it. I couldn't watch it. I actually walked out of it about three quarters of the way through. Was it just really? Uh, yeah, because I just well, I have to confess, I was with my daughter, and I could see she yeah, wasn't yes, enjoying yes, it yes. either. But whether I would have walked out on my own, I don't know. But I found it. Um, I found that manipulation of the audience through the the threat of the you know this guy will do anything. There's no yeah. degradation. He's not. He, he's capable of any degradation. I find that deeply. Maybe it's just maybe that's my black box that I find it so disturbing uh, yeah. that I don't want to look at it. Uh, I, I do think there is a. Uh, it's a version, really. What you've pointed out, I think it's a version of a horror story. Uh, it, oh yeah, know, so all the other things are we like to be scared, sort of ephemeral. It's it's really that person's lack of soul that's the the horrifying thing. The stuff that he does, sure, that's bad, but that's just histrionics. What I thought, the reason I thought it was such a great movie was that the figure of the Joker to me is an iconic figure of human evil. Yep. And it, I didn't see it as manipulative. I saw it as insightful. And the, the reason I mean, that was actually the closing part that I had for this question, Heath Ledger committed suicide. Yeah, that's horrible. And in May of 2013, his father released parts of his diary. And in the diary, Ledger talks about having to confront – the sort of raw edge beyond which you're not really human anymore, even though you're human in form. And so that in, in some ways, obviously he had maybe other difficulties, but confronting what you just said you walked out about, he couldn't walk out. Yeah. He killed himself. Yeah. I, I'm just, confronting that day after day was just too much for him. Yeah, I don't think it helped. I don't know if it was the cause, but it certainly didn't. Right. Help. Yeah. It was. Uh, he had other difficulties, and but in his diary, he did talk about it over and over again, which I thought was was interesting. So that you're you're walking out because you didn't have to stay. It it's not effective for you in the sense that oh, this is a movie villain. I'll have more popcorn. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So Smith is onto something there that's so deep. That well, it, it, I, the, really, the all I wanted to to say was I, I thought that this affirmed on the negative side the things that we had been talking about, the positive side about Smith's insights into human nature. Yeah, that's a great point. That is more than all I had hoped to get through. It was a great pleasure to be able to talk to you about this book, Russ. Mike, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>